wonderful redesigning our accustomed and existing economy, <laughs> so-called capitalism. So in that sense, uh, we thought some kind of a new embeddedness of the economy into ecology or uh, some kind of a, uh, other revisioning and uh, reimagination. So we will invite uh, uh, you to come first about uh, your uh, comment and uh, your redesigning. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jung uh, Ho, uh, for your uh, introduction, and thank you very much, uh, Kathleen, uh, for your extremely inspiring paper and presentation. And uh, that remind me uh, of my interest in cultural economy uh, date back in the 1990s. And in fact, I was trained as a political economist uh, in uh, late 1980s and I studied devel development studies uh, through the lens of world system perspective. And then uh, only after I read a book uh, entitled uh, The End of Capitalism as we knew it, and then I realized uh, there's some limitation uh, for the conventional uh, approach in political economy, uh, such as uh, my school uh, of training. And therefore, I uh, uh, come to uh, get more interest in uh, trying to understand better the uh, social cultural uh, foundation of how we understand uh, the uh, the uh, mechanism of uh, the economy. And uh, then, subsequently, uh, I realized uh, Gibson Graham uh, published. Uh, more book and paper uh, in this area, like uh, post-capitalist politics, and so on and so forth, and also take back uh, the economy. And then they uh, uh, develop further their idea of this diverse economy and also community economy, and now uh, linking up to uh, the uh, ecosystem, and which I find it uh, uh, extremely uh, powerful and also uh, important to enrich our understanding of uh, the, uh, the economic development beyond human uh, society. Uh, I particularly like uh, the paper and also the presentation. Uh, in a way, it uh, enter into the dialogue between uh, the existing approach on uh, trying to capture the interconnection between uh, economy and the ecology, like the resilient science and also the so social ecological resilient uh, approaches. And then uh, Professor Gibson add on to these uh, approaches by uh, bringing in two very important dimensions, which I find it uh, uh, extremely important for us to uh, carry on our uh, project uh, in, in this direction. The first uh, dimension has to do with uh, rethinking uh, what economy means. And, uh, and in that aspect, I, as far as I understand uh, Professor Gibson's approach, she uh, invites us to uh, not really rethink uh, there are uh, different uh, uh, formulation of the economy meaning the perspective on uh, how we look at the economy. But at the same time, she also invites us to uh, rethink the existing uh, economic practices. So uh, in other words, uh, she uh, uh, brought to us uh, two levels of uh, relating to uh, how we could uh, with conceptualization and also redo our practice. In existing, uh, in existing uh, physical world. So both uh, in my work, both uh, not merely diverse economy, but also diverse economics. So uh, my understanding of her approach, uh, which uh, if I may borrow uh, my, our friends in the fields of cultural economy, uh, she is arguing. Uh, in the past, uh, the economists, especially the mainstream economists, trying to uh, economize, economizing uh, almost everything, 
the nature, the household, uh, the community, and so on and so forth. But uh, I would like to emphasize one more thing. I mean, the economy is not really uh, economizing uh, this so-called non-economic entity or non-capitalist entity, but they are also economizing the so-called mainstream economy, such as finance, accounting, money, for instance. So uh, if we uh, trace back to the history, money is not really a so-called economic entity, and it is not only performing a so-called very narrowly defined economic function, like uh, trading, like uh, uh, measuring value in monetary terms, and so on and so forth, but it's also a symbol. It's also a cultural uh, tool connecting people and, uh, in different ways. So in that sense, uh, I very much like uh, what uh, Professor Gibson brought to the end of her presentation, taking back the economy by uh, rethinking the uh, community economic concerns, uh, reconceptualizing what labor, finance, and so on and so forth, uh, property means, and opening up uh, the very rich uh, meaning of all those uh, so-called economic terms which are hijacked by mainstream economies through the economization process. So I think this is very significant. So two levels. One, we have to uh, uh, try to come up with uh, uh, alternative practices in, uh, uh, in uh, our everyday life. Uh, the so-called uh, alternative economic practices as uh, Professor Gibson has shown us uh, very clearly. But at the same time, we may also want to uh, put on a different lens of glasses to look at all those practices. So my uh, uh, humble sub supplement to what uh, Professor Gibson has presented to us is to invite uh, uh, the audience also to uh, uh, to make an even more complicated interconnection between the economic alternative economic practice with the alternative e economic uh, lens. For instance, uh, we have uh, a distinction between capitalist enterprise and non-capitalist enterprise. As shown in the uh, PowerPoint slides. But what if the so-called capitalist enterprise itself also embed certain non-capitalist practice uh, in terms of like mutual trust, uh, in terms of uh, cultural uh, performative uh, 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 relations? Although I mean the uh, the uh, objective is different from what the alternative uh, practice. Uh, 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 directing too. So um, they are both economic and non-economic. They are both uh, profit-making and non-profit-making. The only difference, perhaps to me, is they are doing two different kinds of socio-cultural projects. And in fact, capitalism is a socio-cultural project as much as alternative community practice. It's another socio-cultural project heading to two different directions. And uh, Professor Gibson nicely uh, explains the uh, meaning of all those uh, so-called economic concepts, labor, property, uh, finance, and so on and so forth, that uh, uh, enable us to think along this line. And in fact, the differences have to do with we're uh, looking at two different uh, social cultural projects, which trying to transform human being and non-human environment in two totally different directions. So in that sense, uh, I would say this is an extremely important uh, angle uh, for us to engage in if we want to look, uh, uh, look for uh, alternative uh, com uh, community development. And the other uh, very important dimension, which uh, unfortunately I think Professor Gibson uh, did not have the time to uh, expand on, which is bringing politics back in this community uh, development project. Um, I think a powerful critique uh, in her paper, uh, and also uh, 
uh, hidden in the presentation. I should have one PowerPoint slide uh, highlight this uh, significance of politics and ethical consideration. And that dimension sometimes uh, is forgotten, uh, even among the uh, community practitioners. And um, with the two cases that she uh, uh, present to us in her paper, and again, unfortunately, she didn't have the time to present it, the bamboo bridge and also the incremental uh, housing uh, in a small city in Indonesia, for instance. That two examples uh, highlight uh, the feature and also the logic of uh, what a resilient uh, community project uh, would look like concretely and uh, in a uh, in real situation. But uh, I would like, uh, this is the uh, last thing I want to put uh, forward and also a question for uh, Professor Gibson. I would like to uh, learn more on these two cases uh, as an illustration how politics uh, have been uh, involved in these two cases. How people in these two uh, cases, when they uh, initiate these wonderful projects, which trying to uh, re embed the uh, economy into ecology, human and non human uh, interaction, how they tackle this political uh, 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 context or political uh, uh, um, uh, uh, constraint or enabling factors. Now, um, if they are doing this project in a political wickham, so to speak, for instance, like the late, uh, late uh, the recent uh, development here in Hong Kong, I, I, I guess some of you may uh, be informed by uh, this two million people uh, rally uh, a few days back. And um, in fact, uh, I was in the scene and uh, one amazing thing is uh, the state power, uh, the operator, uh, represented by the police force, they almost completely retreat from the rally scene on that day, June 16. And in fact, uh, the whole demonstration and rally ran smoothly and orderly, <coughs> much better than with the presence of police force as before. Now, without this uh, top-down political intervention, I believe those uh, initiative, community initiative from bottom uh, will be very ripened and efficiently carry out, uh, such as uh, many anthropology have uh, mentioned. Uh, people with first state power, perhaps, I mean, they could uh, perform even better with the existing of this state politics. But uh, that's an ideal situation. Now, uh, my question is, uh, the state and also the uh, political power from the top, I think they have their uh, interest stake uh, in all this project. When you're trying to uh, build a bamboo bridge, and then next to this bamboo bridge, you also mentioned there's a permanent uh, bridge uh, in the north of the uh, bamboo bridge, and they are uh, relying on this more developmental logic. And then they are kind of like, I don't know whether they're competitive or not, but still, I mean, they're adapting different logic. And the state and also the uh, multinational uh, corporation, they have their vast interest in the area and in the neighborhood. And then they may want to intervene into this uh, resilient community project. And how uh, people there uh, perhaps resist or handle, tackle, or creatively uh, work with or transform this uh, uh, top-down state uh, uh, political intervention. And that, I think, uh, perhaps will be supplement your uh, great idea of bringing the politics back in. So that's the question I have. Thank you very much. É, bom, boa noite, inclusive, para quem está no Brasil nos assistindo. Good night for everyone that is watching us from Brazil right now. <laughs> é, gostaria de saudar a mesa, especialmente a Catherine. I would like to um, salute the, the panel, especially uh, Catherine. 
e dizer que para mim foi bastante desafiador ler o texto. And to say that for me it was really challenging to read your article. Primeiro pela língua, óbvio. First of all, uh, because uh, due to uh, language. E depois porque parte de um lugar que eu não estou muito habituado. And second because it comes from a perspective that I'm not really used to. Mas o que eu acho fundamental nessa discussão que nós estamos fazendo aqui é um debate paradigmático it's a paradigmatic debate. em que há uma separação entre dois conceitos que são fundamentais. Where there is a separation between two concepts that are essential. A ecologia e a economia. Ecology and economy. No Brasil temos um professor In Brazil, we have a professor que fala da divisão entre agricultura e agronegócio. That the division between uh, agriculture and agribusiness. E por isso temos que refletir também sobre essa epistemologia. And therefore we have to uh, reflect on this epistemology. E olhando para isso e principalmente para sua apresentação, Catherine. And look to this and especially to your presentation, Catherine. Digo que nos encontramos nas nossas metodologias. I think we have met each other in our methodologies. É, acho importante situar é, de onde venho e de onde estou falando. I think it is important for you to know um, where I come from and uh, my perspective. Eu falei há uns dias atrás aqui uh, I have said here a of days ago que a nossa cabeça deve pensar aonde os nossos pés pisam. That our heads must think where our feet lands. E por isso tenho é, feito em minha trajetória And that's why I have been doing my de militância política as a political militant. uma busca né, por estudar as minhas práticas. A search to uh, understand my practices, to study my practices. E desde a faculdade de agronomia. And since uh, I was uh, studying agronomy, agronomy. E da minha militância junto ao MST. And my uh, activism with the uh, MST Brazilian Landless Movement. Me encontrei na academia no campo. I have uh, found myself in a field within the academy, the academy da geografia do trabalho. Um, where I study the um, geography of the work. Partimos de alguns autores. We have some uh, some um, authors como Marx, such as Marx, Lukács, Lukács e Mesaros. And Stephen Mesaros. Homens europeus. <risos> e para mim uma mulher fundamental, Rosa Luxemburgo. And for me, one woman that is a, one woman that is ascension is Rosa Luxemburgo. E a provocação e aí vou entrando naquilo que devemos conversar aqui. And uh, what I like to bring into the discussion and I'm gonna go now in what I wanted to discuss here parte de uma categoria fundamental que é o trabalho. Comes from uh, a fundamental um, category that is work. E o trabalho, em seu entendimento mais básico, and work in its most basic understanding, como a relação entre o ser humano e a natureza. Is a relationship um, between um, human beings and nature. E pensando como nos ensina Lukács, and thinking Uh, as uh, Lukács taught us, e também o Marx, and also Marx, que ao lidar com a natureza, o ser humano se transforma. That when we deal with nature, um, human beings transform itself, uh, themselves. E que o trabalho tem essa característica humanizadora <risos> fundamental. And that work has this humanizing fundamental um, characteristic. E isso não e o trabalho nos coloca numa relação profunda e infinita com a natureza. And work um, put us in a um, fundamental and infinite relationship with nature. O que vem a alterar essas relações? 
What alters this uh, relationship? É o desenvolvimento de sociedades opressoras. Is the development of oppressive societies. Que tem por objetivo fundamental. That has as it main go, it main go. Separar aqueles que trabalham dos meios de produção. To separate those who do the work with the means of production. Of production. E aí chegamos a sociedades de classe que desenvolvem é, mecanismos de controle. And that's when we arrive to the class society that uh, develops um, control mechanisms. O capital em sua necessidade de destruir capital in its need to destroy para construir e lucrar to rebuild and profit cria contradições uh, creates contradiction então nós voltamos so we go back a exploração de recursos naturais e de mais valia separa os trabalhadores dos meios de produção <risos> sorry <risos> dos recursos naturais of, uh, e da mais-valia separa os trabalhadores dos meios de produção. From the means of o que gera anomalias and that como o colonialismo, such as o militarismo e o machismo. And, uh, machismo. Mas ao mesmo tempo que cria essas anomalias e essas formas de dominação, But at the same time that it creates these anomalies and this uh, ways of domination, cria contradições, it also creates contradictions entre aqueles que negam ou não se submetem à lógica. Between those who deny or do not um, submit themselves to that logic. E portanto resistem. And therefore they resist. Para nós, no Brasil, for us in Brazil, e especialmente para o MST, and for the MST, tratamos de resistência. We, uh, talk about porque nós não recriamos, we do not recreate, nem nos adaptamos, or adapt. o modelo que é vigente não nos cabe. O modelo que está acontecendo não nos cabe para nós. Resistimos e buscamos construir we resist and we seek to build sociabilidades que subvertam a lógica estabelecida. Sociabilities that, she, she knows that, right? sociabilities that um, change this um, established logic. Se a ordem é machista, if the um, way of things is machista, gritamos com todas as nossas forças. We uh, call with our, all of our strengths que sem feminismo não há socialismo. that without feminism there is no socialism. Se a ordem é exploração, If the order is exploitation, não nos subjugamos. We won't, um, be under it. <risos> Construímos as cooperativas. We will build cooperatives. Se a ordem é a destruição da natureza, If the order is of nature, buscamos produzir alimentos sadios we seek to food a partir de agroflorestas. In o que é importante pensar What is important to think, que este não é um momento de espera. That this is not a é um momento de enfrentamento. It's a, a moment of clash. Lutar para nós é afirmar todos os dias to struggle for us is to reaffirm every day como afirmou Florestan Fernandes what Florestan Fernando said não se deixar cooptar do not let yourselves be cooptated não se deixar esmagar to not let ourselves to be crushed lutar sempre is struggle always a criação das nossas estratégias de resistência and to create our strategies of resistance passa por um retorno ancestral. Goes, um, the way of an e essa luta por esse retorno And that for that return, não pode ser individual. Be an individual one. Ela tem que ser uma luta coletiva. It has to be a esse retorno ancestral This é a negação da lógica do mercado. Is to deny the, uh, logic. Logic. 
É, por isso são revolucionárias. That's why they are revolutionary. As práticas de lutar para. Um, that's why these practices to struggle for are revolutionary. Manter o nosso patrimônio genético. We struggle to keep our genetic patrimony. Ou as nossas sementes crioulas. Or our creole seeds. Subvertendo inclusive a ordem que você apresenta falando da Monsanto. Subverting including this order that you presented that uh, talks about Monsanto. É revolucionário também It's also revolutionary construir relações harmônicas com a natureza. To build harmonic relationships with nature. Construir relações justas de trabalho. To build fair um, work relationships. Construir a cooperação. To build cooperation. Construir consciência de classe. To build class conscious. Construir uma consciência feminista. To build a feminist consciousness. E entre tantas construções, nós And chamamos a academia. And uh, among all these uh, constructions, all uh, this um, building, we call for the academy. Construam mais. To build more. Proponham mais. To propose more. Lutem mais. To struggle more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for wonderful discuss for discussions. Uh, based on your own life and experiences. Uh, and uh, first, uh, I will give uh, uh, you for, for some kind of uh, your comment on these kind of discussions. And later on, we will open to the floor. OK, will you? Okay, well, thank you so much, both of you, for your uh, wonderful engagements and comments. And um, I'm not sure I'll be able to do justice to them, but I'll try. And uh, I, I guess I want to say, first of all, that, <clears throat> of course, everything I'm saying is very much coming out of my own um, situation. And the situation of different people around the world is quite different. And I don't, uh, I hope that what I'm talking about has resonance, but it isn't necessarily going to be applicable in all, all ways, you know. <coughs> but I'll, I think I'll first just um, come back to PK's comments and then um, move to Anna's after that. I think uh, the idea of different economies being kind of different socio-cultural projects is a really interesting one, I think. And, um, and I'm wondering how far we can push that. Um, one of the things that I didn't do in the talk, I didn't show, was the diversity that you could also um, portray in that top layer of capitalist relations, you know? And I think the diverse economy framework is very engaged with diversity, um, diverse kinds of markets, diverse kinds of um, <clears throat> capitalist enterprises, and so on. And uh, interesting, I've just been involved in a research project on manufacturing in Australia, because it's uh, like many countries, uh, manufacturing is on decline, uh, at least there's a sense in which it's dead and um, because there's been offshoring and all this uh, takeovers by companies and then moving away and so on. But um, in the project we started to look for companies, both capitalist, uh, social enterprises and cooperatives that were doing something around uh, just sustainability. We used um, Julian Argument's term about economic justice and actual sustainability. And what we ended up finding was that there were some interesting capitalist firms, including transnational capitalist firms, who are very motivated by um, producing ecologically um, responsible manufacturing, <laughs> driven by visions that are, to some extent, compromise their uh, private returns. Um, so not all capitalist business, I think, is the same. And, uh, and many of the people involved in um, manufacturing are involved in it because of the love uh, for problem solving, 
for working with materials, for innovation, and so on. And um, so it makes me think that, you know, I don't think we can be that clear about a capitalist socio-cultural project and a non-capitalist socio-cultural project. I think we have to be much more fine-grained in our analysis uh, because it seemed from our project that, in fact, when we brought the firms together, um, they found so much commonality between the, some of the social enterprises that are involved in um, materials recycling, but main, their main uh, opportunity is to employ lots of people, <laughs> but they're involved in things like mattress recycling and so on or uh, electronics recycling. And the, 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 co the co-op was a, as a dairy co-op, also engaged with um, keeping family farming alive in northern New South Wales. So the capitalist so-called CEOs and the others all found such a, an interesting kind of set of concerns that they shared around um, ecological sustainability and producing good jobs for people. So I think um, the diverse economy's perspective can be used to start to identify uh, those firms or, or economic practices happening within capitalist firms that can actually be uh, advancing this agenda of more building more ethical economies alongside the kinds of enterprises we might more likely to think are doing that, like worker cooperatives or uh, worker-owned cooperatives or social, social enterprises, many of which are constrained by questions of financial um, access and so on. So yes, there's different, there are different socio-cultural projects, but I think the project of building more ecologically and socially sustainable societies is shared by some people who would be associated with capitalist activity, and I think we need to identify those people and work with them more than we probably have thought uh, when we see them as a block doing terrible things like degrading environments and so on. So, and in the case of Interface Carpets, which is well known for this kind of behaviour, the, the CEO who had this moment of deep, um, you know, he felt a spear had gone through his heart when he realised that his company was plundering the world because it was still involved in uh, fossil fuel kind of production of carpet and they've moved totally away from that now. But for, for many years he just stockpiled carpet before they figured out a way of doing proper recycling and staying with the materials that they have. So that's an interesting thing where he, he filled warehouses across Texas full of this stuff before the scientists could figure out a way of actually figuring out the, the technology of recycling. So there's a kind of interesting commitment there that's not around his own personal profit but around something else. So I think we have to see su subjects, economic subjects, as multiply constructed and decentered, and that's another aspect of our work too, is to take on this question of economic subjectivity. And I think um, you know, some of the issues around today's kind of our, um, <clears throat> our un well, dissatisfaction and our kind of uh, incomprehension of some of the ways that electoral politics is going at the moment, which we mentioned yesterday, could well be helped by thinking of decentered subjects and subjects having multiple interests that are, happen are being appealed to in different ways. Uh, so many people that might be seen as our enemies may have elements um, of their own subjectivity that we can work with. But... Um, yeah, so I guess the point is to say that the diverse economies isn't just about so-called alternatives, and in fact we tried to get away from this idea of alternative and mainstream because it's another binarism that sort of locks us into uh, problematic kind of assumptions. Because again, there can be quite a few worker cooperatives that are working in ways that we might question. You know. But that um, brings us on to the question of um, context and politics. And um, it's true that the, the analysis in the paper of the two cases didn't go into that um, side of things. And partly I haven't had the opportunity to do a lot of the research on the politics and context of those two cases. I do know that in the case of the Bamboo Bridge in Cambodia, um, 
<clears throat> the pre-existing concrete bridge that I mentioned at the beginning um, is the bridge that was built over the Mekong that opened up the eastern and western parts of Cambodia many years ago. Um, and that's been there for many years. But uh, as the film showed, a new concrete bridge is now being built to the island of Koh Phen, so that the, the bamboo bridge that's still on the image down there is no longer being built um, because uh, of this development, you know, uh, development uh, gift financed by Chinese funding, um, a gift that was then part and parcel of uh, Hun Sen's kind of um, agenda to be re-elected because it, it happened just before the election. So there's a very much a, a political story around the infrastructure issues in this, la this case. And this new concrete bridge will now open up Copan, which is a, a rural community, to property speculation and, and, and property development now uh, for Kampon Chan, the big city that's on the other side of the river. Um, the politics of how it was built um, <clears throat> in the past uh, were a different order of politics, I think. And um, it was very much a community self-help project that was... Um, <clears throat> I don't know what's happened there. <laughs> I didn't do that. Um, a community self-help project that initiate, was initiated by the community uh, and then um, the building was stopped during the, the Pol Pot regime and then was resumed again. And over time, as, the, as rural society in Cambodia has become more cash-oriented, it's become more run by, as a business. Um, so, you know, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of political analysis, I think, that could be brought to bear on that case. And I guess the point of making that case was really, somehow the PowerPoint's in some kind of weird free fall. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing anything, am I? I haven't got a mouse. <laughs> anyway, it's a panoramic view through PowerPoint. <laughs> um, the point of it was really to illustrate something around other kinds of knowledge. It's not to do the, the political stuff, but I, I think, um, I guess I, I'm interested in a politics that's very grounded because I think I'm a bit unhappy with that kind of notion of uh, power already being distributed to certain institutions or authorities in abstraction. Um, I'm very interested in empirical analysis that tries to do this kind of assemblage politics and looks at how these uh, assemblages come together and are durable or, or are made vulnerable. Um, in the case of the Indonesian um, incremental housing, uh, it's only one demonstration house that's now been built. That was very much a, a design project, but um, the, the one that's been built is on that in the island and is being very much um, used as a model and a support for that local community and the local municipality is very interested in this as a potential way of resolving some of the issues around um, migration to the area and so on. But I haven't done a, any detailed political analysis there either. Um, another case that I didn't talk about but I've been more involved in is a case in Paris of a kind of commoning of um, vacant land in a municipality on the edges of Paris by a project that was led by architects um, to try and build an ecological hub for a, a, a kind of immigrant community. And um, that was very successful in, in establishing a, uh, a community farm and agro, an agro city, a kind of centre for education and learning around ecology, and a recycling centre built on half of a road because uh, the, the idea is in, in the future roads won't be needed and we'll need to use that space. Um, and it was a process of commoning that was then immediately cut short when the um, municipal elections took place and a right-wing mayor came to bear whose husband was a property developer and she forced the project which had been funded by the EU and was supposed to last for 15 years, she forced it to close. All of the buildings had been built to be dismantled again in a, in a few days. And what's interesting is that that project has been resituated in another um, municipality quite close and is now being replicated in three different locations across Paris. 
So here you have a case situation where politics intervened to uncommon something that had been commoned, but there's a rhizomatic kind of spread, and other municipalities are now picking up on this idea. Um, so I think uh, the idea of commoning and uncommoning is uh, a useful one. The process of commoning never stops. It is never sorted. There's, the commons is never stable. It always has to be rebuilt and remade in the face of political changes. And I think um, that that is where you know I think where that's where a political analysis can really come in, come to bear. And actually, I do. I did want to mention at the end of the talk um, this idea that we could use a kind of yardstick, a commons yardstick, which is at the back there, around gener generational changes and the attempts to try and common and build ethical economies that come uh, take three steps forward and two steps back over time. And one of the cases that gives us a lot of um, uh, hope is the kind of commoning of the ozone hole over time that has been a set of different kinds of struggles, different constituencies, different um, scientific information, different representations. I mean, the fact that it could be photographed had a huge impact on and mobilising people to make sure that the Mo Montreal Protocol would take place. But, you know, way back it was also um, the, the uh, feelings of people in London that needed to introduce Clean Air Acts in the 50s. Um, it was plumbers who decided to, in, in their unions, to stop installing CFC refrigerators and so on. So, what we've seen, one of the few, <laughs> one of the few indicators of the Anthropocene that shows a turnaround is that one on stratigraph stratigraphic ozone. It's one of the few of the great accelerations that started to change, and it's happened through a whole range of uh, activities, political activities and an, what I would call a sort of an assemblage politics that brings to bear some of the politics that, that Rebecca was talking about yesterday, the very activist kind of stuff, but also the politics of representation, of scientific uh, instruments and instrumentation, a kind of interesting mixture of legal processes and um, activist processes. Um, and the other, the other indicator that's starting to change, it isn't shown there in that diagram, but urban population, I mean, sorry, the population explosion has started to turn around now in the sense that generate, you know, replacement is starting to be met. And I, I would see that as one of the major impacts of an, in, the impact of feminism um, and, children, and girls' education historically, although the demographers like to put it down to um, economic development, but I think feminism's had a major play there. So, you know, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is that... Um, Commoning and uncommoning, these activities have to be seen over a very long period and, um, and in generational terms. And we need to be thinking uh, seven generations hence, as the Indigenous people teach us, when we think about success and failure. I think the language of success and failure is a very, can often be a very debilitating one. And we heard a little bit of that kind of language yesterday. Things have failed. And it's, it's true that certain things fail, and I think it's up to us as um, intellectuals and researchers to actually find the things that haven't and that still connect. Um, so then to come to Anna's comments, and um, it's, it's wonderful to hear about the work of the movement that you're involved in because I see it as very much engaged in this struggle for building ethical economies against a very powerful, you know, 400 years of oppression. Um, and uh, the other thing that she mentioned, I think, that I've, I've touched on again, is this idea that there needs to be sociabilities that change the logic. And to me, that points to this question of subjectivity, of the subject position one can occupy, and how important it is for um, these uh, um, activities, for these um, actions, to work with people to start to inhabit different kinds of economies, economies that are around care, around um, stewardship, uh, economies that, um, you know, maybe at points co-opted but then can be re-co-opted back for the community. Uh, and I think um, 
denying market logics is a very hard thing to do because it's also part of our subjectivity. Our, the consumption desire for new things is very much part of what uh, we've been brought up to, to, to want. And it's very hard for especially societies that are rapidly developing where people are suddenly having access to consumption items to suddenly stand up and resist that and say, oh, we've got to move beyond that. So I think we have to be very careful around how we construct uh, the subjectivities that will take us through to this new form of humanity and, um, and be very careful about uh, generalising from cases where some people who have had a lot of wealth and consumption items are ready to give them up and others who are just accessing them don't want to. And that there needs to be some real interesting discussion there around what kinds of ways, where we can come together around different kinds of um, more ethical subjects. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there and let